Good morning, guys. This morning we have David Kong, um, and a man who does not need any kind of introductions. Um, and uh, you know, we're, we're we're so fortunate to have you this morning, uh, Mr. Kong. And thank you for making time. Uh, welcome to Hotel Bizlink um, show. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to be at Hotel Bizlink. I appreciate the kind invitation. You're welcome here. You're welcome. Anytime, anytime. You know that. So uh, we have um, uh, the first of first questions that we want to ask you is that the um, your new ventures. So tell us a little bit about your new ventures. What's the motive behind it? Uh, you know, what's inspired you and what are you, uh, uh, you know, about to do with your new venture? OK, thanks for that question. Uh, first, uh, let me give some background. Uh, for a very, very long time, I was the lone minority CEO at the CEO panels uh, at many industry conferences. And I, I just didn't think it's right. There's so many capable Asian Americans, African Americans. There's just so many people of uh, minority origin that should, should have a chance at the executive leadership position levels of our hotel industry. And if you look at our industry, it's actually a very diverse industry. Our customers are diverse. Our industry base, employee base is also very diverse. But there's some unfairness to that diversity in a sense that if you picture a triangle, uh, which is like a hierarchy of different levels of positions in hotels or in a corporate world in the hotel industry, we are very concentrated on the bottom with minority representation. So if you look at the whole triangle as a whole, you think, oh, we're doing great. Our diversity mirrors that of our customer base. But when you look into it further, you've noticed that the diversity is concentrated on the bottom rungs. And it's just not right. And there are very few women or minorities that are in executive leadership positions in our industry. So recognizing that, I, I set out to do something about it. I've always thought that it was unfair and diversity, inclusion, equity, these are the fundamental values of uh, our society as well as for any good business. And we, we should um, try to embrace that. And I also am very heartened to see that a lot of big hotel companies, Selton Marriott, IHG and the like, they all have very good DE and I and ESG programs. And they are in many ways trying to help minorities and women move up to the executive leadership position. So there's really not a need for me to interject myself in that endeavor. But I do notice that despite these programs, some individuals don't know how to take advantage of these programs and leverage them to broaden their horizon and be ready for big positions when they do open up. So I set out to empower individuals help them realize what they could do to move up the ladder, how they need to prepare themselves and things they need to do to broaden their horizon and gain knowledge and skill set. And so they'd be ready for those positions when the opportunity knocks. Love it, love it. You know what, um, uh, the way you put it, I've actually, I mean, it's, there's a gap there, but I've never actually looked at from the lenses that you just explained. It is so true and it is much needed. And you are right that we do have talents, enormous amount of talents who struggle to climb that corporate ladder. And they don't also oftentimes get that opportunity. And especially being minority, uh, you're always, you know, you, you I mean, uh, I, I personally faced, you know, uh, same circumstances. Uh, I faced barrier. Um, it, it's, it's, it, you know, I. It's like, you know, what you're setting out to do, I need that myself, you know, 20 years ago, I needed that. I mean, I had to literally, you know, push so many doors to get myself presence. Uh, you know, I remember earlier days, I mean, I mean, right now I'm in Texas, right? So uh, a guy like me uh, trying to do business in West Texas, it could be difficult. I remember whenever I was going to a uh, Rotary Club or Lions Club or anything like that, they would look at me like I'm a Martian <laughs> and I don't belong. What are you doing? So oftentimes I would have, to, I mean, I crack joke. I'm saying, hey, deep down, there's a redneck over here. 
<laughs> right? You might That's see a good this, one. <laughs> yeah, you might see this, you know, Caucasian or, or Egyptian looking or Mexican looking guy. But the deep down men, I <laughs> the red neck over here, just to crack jokes and open up, you know, that environment. And it was funny that as I went into these uh, clubs, everyone would stare at me like I didn't belong there. And I really have to do things to uh, blend in. And similarly in corporate world, uh, you know, I felt like, you know, I have, ex I, I mean, I've had experiences well above and I was hardworking. Um, I didn't get that opportunity for X, Y, Z reasons. Um, but anyway, and a life moves on, uh, you know, uh, I was able to do things uh, that changed that. I, I wish there were someone taking initiative, something like that. Even myself, I should have taken some sort of an initiative like that. I want from my heart to heart, like from bottom of my heart, I want to thank you for doing what you're doing. It is going to um, bring out a lot of pearls throughout the industry for what you're doing. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you. And you know, your example of uh, being at a road day club and you stand out because you're so different than everybody else that's in the club is exactly uh, the point of this whole endeavor. Because sometimes as a woman or as a minority, you sit in a meeting and everybody is white male, you immediately feel like you don't belong. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. that, yeah. how do you overcome that? Yeah. You know, I was interviewing Gilda uh, Perez Al Al Alvarado, who is a global CEO of JLL the other day. And she said, well, I tell myself I'm just different. I'm not inferior. I tell myself I'm just different. In your case, you cracked the joke and you broke the eyes, which made you, uh, which endeared yourself to, to the group, uh, which is the kind of thing that we all need to do when we are in that situation. Very well, much. Yeah, you know, well said. And, and you know, a lot of admire for Gilda, by the way. Uh, she's doing an awesome job. And, you know, last year she was at the lodging conference. So hopefully she'll be there this year too. And I'm guessing you're also going to be there. You've been there all the time, right? Yes. So hope to see you at the conference, the lodging conference, yeah. right? Yeah. So uh, one of the things, uh, you know, uh, I always share with all my hotelier colleagues is that, you know, we do business in small towns. Don't be afraid to walk into the Chamber of Commerce. Don't be afraid to walk into the Sheriff Office, the Police Office. All of these places, go present yourself. The reason uh, they're afraid of you is because of the unknown, right? They don't know you. Once they get to know you, they'll open door for you, right? And you know, make your presence and do whatever you can for each uh, community from your particular level, right? Any way you can contribute, contribute, and you'll get things back from it. Enough about me and everything else. I do have, um, uh, another question regarding your venture. Um, so is this limit to any specific uh, type of talents that you're looking into or uh, keep, give us a variation of what you're trying to achieve, please? It's, it's, a, it's I, I hope the information that uh, I collect through learnings and perspectives from different uh, executive leaders in the industry would be helpful to anyone. It's not just for women, it's not just for minority groups, it's for everyone. But obviously, you know, women and minorities are at a bit of a challenged uh, position, so particularly for them. So if you think about the um, kinds of questions that I ask, I, I asked, uh, for example, Pat Patius the other day about how he remains so calm and collected and has so much uh, courage and grace in handling the pandemic, for example. Uh, I asked uh, how Jeff Bellotti, um came up the letter because he was like me, a, a, a dishwasher. <laughs> and then he became a busboy and then he yes. became a waiter. Yes. And look how, he's, how far he's come. Yes. And so that journey teaches us a lot of things. You know, we talked about the different lessons that you learn along the way. Pat Patius, for example, through his journey, he said he, he got exposure to a lot of different areas, including technology. That's how he was prepared to take on a CEO role. I asked um, Heather McCrory from Accor Hotels uh, how she got to her position because her whole career had been with McCor or previous to that, Femon, FRXI, and, and it's the same company. 
And she said, you know, at some point she came up with the sales and marketing letter. At some point she realized that she needed to broaden horizon. So she went and got herself an MBA. And then she asked to go into operations. And that's how she rounded herself off to, to be eligible to be the CEO of Co Hotels North in Central America. So when you talk to people like that, you learn so much from them. I asked uh, Marco Popanasium at Hyatt about the Hyatt's purpose statement to care for people so they can be more successful. I just love that because, you know, imagine if that was our own personal brand statement. You know, yeah. if we all had that, what kind of world would we live in? I mean, to care for people so they can be successful. So you, you learn so much from uh, talking to different people and the whole purpose of my initiative is to share those learnings because there's so much wisdom. Awesome, awesome, I love it. By the way, um, um, it, that reminds me of our, uh, our first interview interactions when you and I were having, and I love the way that you gave us your background and what you did and how you climbed the ladder. One thing I loved about you, you was that the, you always take on more without looking for the compensation and that's what got you where you're at. You know, do what you need to do, the money will follow you, position will follow you. That's something that I learned personally from you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate saying that. And, and in talking to a lot of the industry leaders, they all talk about you need to be you, you need to be genuine yes. and authentic. Yes. Yes. And the love has to be there. The passion needs yeah. to be there. If you're not yeah. passionate, don't do it. So, That's right. so uh, what I'm getting is that the, you are planning to bring out these um, uh, informations uh, from all of these key position members, and then you want people to utilize, listen to it, look at it, implement it, and do what that. But are you handpicking any uh, particular type of people and mentoring anyone? Yeah, the, the information is shared through our website. By the way, it's uh, deiadvisors.org. And it's also on YouTube and uh, Facebook channels, DEI Advisors, D, Diversity, E, Equity, I, Inclusion. DEI advisors. And I try to interview a variety of people. And I have two other ladies that are helping me. One is Rachel Humphrey, whom you know very well. Yes. And the other one is Len Elliott, Elliot, who has also been in the business for a very long time. So we all know some people and we try to add variety. Um, most recently, uh, we've interviewed a couple of executive recruiters. So we asked them how a candidate should prepare their resume and how they should prepare for interviews and, and the like. And the one lady that I talked to is from Corn Ferry. Uh, her name is Radhika Pap Papandrea. And she talked about how it's always a long game. You, you, when they called you for a certain position, you may not get that position, but how you handle the call informing you that you didn't get the position is gonna determine whether she calls you again or not. <laughs> if you react well and she can see the empathy and maturity in you, she's going to think about you next time when she has an opening because those are signs of leadership. So you always want to think about, first of all, how you react to those rejection calls, if you would. But you also think about the long game, which is building a relationship with those executive recruiters. So I thought those were wonderful tips. And I ask her also, what are the qualities that she looks for? And she talks about compassion. She talks about agility, strategic agility, like being able to change things quickly, depending on the circumstances. Um, Kilda actually talked about that. You know, she talked about in her career in 2008, uh, she had a, a huge uh, business plan she was put in charge of and she was going to execute it and born and behold it was financial meltdown and so I had to totally change the plan and re and pivot and change it to actually a workout kind of a approach uh, that JLL would take on so how you okay, how agile you are in adapting to what's happening around you is really important so those were really good learnings I thought that we should all think about 
yeah, yeah, it's so true, so true. Love it, love it. I had, I did look at some of your interviews, and I was like, awesome. This is, this is great. And also, one other thing that I love about yours is that the, you have been uh, in, in the mingling with all of these key position individuals. Not everyone can access them, even if, you know, even they want to. So you have that access, and we do appreciate you bringing out and asking those tough questions and soft questions, uh, and giving their, you know, a livelihood from uh, start to you know, where they are right now, that is something uh, that we all can learn from and uh, we all can motivate. So guys, you heard it from Mr. David Kong that you know, if you need a motivation, if you need to know how the others did it, make sure you tune into his channel on his YouTube channels, which is DEI, right? YouTube channel is DEI. DEI advisors, yeah. Oh, so advisors.org. Um, so dot org. So I'm seeing this is a nonprofit organization. Yeah, it's an Arizona nonprofit corporation. Arizona nonprofit. Okay. Anyone tipping into it? Or anyone? Anyone? Oh no, it's a, I'm, I'm funding the whole thing myself. It's uh, my way of giving back to the industry and doing something, <laughs> paying it forward. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. We truly appreciate that. Um, so this is this was our first phase that where we would like to know a little bit about what you're doing and what um, you know the EI is all about. Thank you for sharing all that information. We really appreciate it. But I do have a tough um, uh, next 15, 20, 30 minutes, whatever you can give us is that, as you know, that hospitality industry is being challenged. And we've been always challenged with all kinds of uh, recessions, you know, economy problem, this problem, that problem. But right now, the word recession is up in the horizon. And uh, I recall the last recession, it wasn't pretty. I have seen millionaires, guys that own 30, 40, 50, 60 hotels, 100 you know, hotel portfolio, gone down to their single motel. And I've also seen guys who's got single motel who became a, a, a billionaires, you know, it all, you know, how everyone played the game and how they uh, understood the recession and survived. One of the things that I do wanted to ask you is that the, um, from your perspective, with all that experience that you have, you know, you, you, you have gone through with Best Western, is uh, please share a, a roadmap, if you will, how someone should navigate if there is a recession in here. Okay, well, the first thing I would the first thing I would offer is don't panic. Don't panic because if you look back in history, um, when we panicked in in two thousand after nine eleven, two thousand and one after nine yeah. eleven, you know a lot of hotels were put up for sale immediately because they thought travel was going to be so severe impacted. Well, it didn't pan out that way, and in fact, that wasn't too bad a recession. And so if you panic, then you sold the, your property at that time, you, you would have made a grave mistake. Um, the, the fact of the matter is the industry goes through cycles. And if you're not prepared <laughs> to have a downturn, you shouldn't be in business because, you know, it's just the way things are. You just go through cycles. You, you, when times are good, you put some money away so you can weather the storm when times do get tough. Uh, but we've gone through so many cycles in our industry and look at where we are. I mean, we've gone through the worst downturn in year 2000, 20, um, I mean, just during the pandemic, I mean, 2020, yeah, it was just yeah. like an absolute awful, awful, uh, but we went at that. So I, I, I think, I think uh, we just have to keep things in perspective. Now, what are the same things that you can do Right now is actually a good time when, when the average rate is so strong. Um, and I know the expenses are kind of out of control because of supply chain challenges and the need to increase wages. And, and so the expenses are high and we need to have high average rate, but high average rate has gone up a lot. I mean, this is the highest average rate we've ever, ever seen in the industry. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good time to put some money away and save for a rainy day. For the most part, the, the power, the, the ability to charge a higher average rate is still there. I mean, there's still strong pricing power, which indicates that we're not facing a downturn. You know, if you're, if you're facing a downturn, then the demand uh, would be softer, and then you wouldn't be able to come at that kind of rate. But if you look at rates, especially in, 
the major markets, um, Hawaii, for example, are just out of sight. I'm going to Maui um, in a few weeks, and you're paying over a thousand dollars a night. Yeah. I mean, it's just so strong. It's never been this strong. And it, it, if you want to go to Europe, especially, it's the, the rates are out of sight. So I, I think uh, put things in perspective, put some money away to save for a rainy day, and. Of course, there are lots of things that you can do when we do have a downturn. I mean, we've been through these cycles many times, so I don't have to tell you what to do. Uh, you just watch your expenses and, and try to maximize revenue. Got you. So guys, this is what I'm getting from uh, Mr. Kong advice is that the number one, don't panic. Number two, don't forget about your nest egg. Nest egg is always necessary. Now that you have a business, uh, make sure you put some of this uh, uh, you know, NASDAQ away for the rainy days that's, that might come or may or may not have happened, right? Um, uh, part of the industry expert, what they're saying is that the recession might be at a peak toward the end of the year, God knows. And in terms of expert, now these days, no one can predict what's happening. <laughs> I've seen market, they were supposed to crash and then boom, it took up and it went all the way to the top. And I was like, what happened? We missed it. So, you know, being optimistic is one of the key points that I always share with everyone, that being in a hospitality, we are probably the most optimistic creature. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you probably heard that from me again, you know, in the, in the past. So uh, optimism is something that I've always asked. So guys, you heard it. Three things that I got from, and a key takeaway from this one is that number one is don't panic. Number two is have nest tag. And number three is have a plan. Am I right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Now, Right. So have a plan that how you're going to navigate through this. So, Mr. Kong, uh, you know, we're going to stay in this topic a little bit uh, in terms of uh, navigation wise. Right. Um, do you suggest that if you see that there is a recession that's taking place or may take place? Do a renovation right now or not? Well, you need to make sure your product is competitive, because if you're going through a downturn, you're gonna be hurt a lot if your product is not competitive. So, I mean, that's a, that's like the price of entry. You've got to make sure your product is is competitive. But on on the point of uh, recession, if we if we do experience one and occupancy becomes soft, uh, I'd like you to remember one thing which my regional vice president told me when I was a general manager. Uh, I was in Chicago and we go through a very soft uh, winter every year, January, February, you know, some hotels run 30 some percent occupancy. So I was lamenting to my regional vice president. I said, well, I, I mean, it's just the, the seasonality of it. Um, we have to, I, I think we're gonna be running 35% occupancy next month. And he asked me, so what's the occupancy in the area? And how many hotels are there? I said, there are 10 hotels in the area and everybody is running 35% or so. He said, well, if everyone is running 35% or so, there are 10 hotels, why don't you take a couple points of occupancy from everyone, where would you be? And I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> I mean, we think about just protecting our share. We don't think about growing our share. How about taking some business from your competitors in, in that kind of situation, right? So how do you do that? Well, a lot of people immediately start cutting back. So what I did, uh, I was managing a Hyatt at that time. I decided, well, at that time, there was no free breakfast. I mean, Hampton and, and the like went around. So I decided to offer free continental breakfast to all the um, corporate accounts, preferred accounts that have uh, local uh, negotiated rates with us. I decided to offer them that. And then immediately, I, I stole market share from everybody. So think well, about how you can spend a lot of money create a differentiation that people would appreciate, and then they come and stay with you rather than somebody else. Love it. You know, what you just said, I have implemented that personally myself on a fixer upper. Uh, back in the days, I picked out a property. Um, I overpaid the property, by the way. The property uh, was going for, uh, you know, for an example, let's say it was going for a million, I paid million and a half, right? But I paid million and a half after doing my due diligence. One of the things I tell people is that do your due diligence, look at the market and look at the potential. Don't look at, yes, you need a property, but also look at the potential, what you can do. Look at yourself. You know, your, you know what you can put out there. So look at yourself and then go ahead and make that investment. 
Um, I did some research and got into that particular business. I implemented that exactly same model. The hotel was a large hotel, one of the largest hotel in that particular town. And as I looked at it, uh, uh, my immediate competition was uh, uh, ISG because ISG was producing the largest revenue in that market. And I'm like, and we have the largest hotel. And there was about a dozen hotel in that town. And I said, if I can take 5% from each one of them, I've made it, right? I'll, you know, revenue was below half a million dollars. Implementing what you just said, we scored, we made higher, uh, uh, one year we made higher, but at, we actually went close to the ISG numbers. Um, it was $1.5 million revenue is what we hit from less than a half a million dollar property. Two simple things that I worked on, exactly what you said. One was that the property struggled with all kinds of renovation issue. We started maintaining and cleaning. I didn't have the money. I'm gonna be honest with you. I didn't have the money. I poured everything that I had into that particular project. Um, and I was pretty thinned out with other projects that I was working on. And looking at it was that we saw that the biggest issue that we had was a cleaning and maintenance issue. I went ahead and hired one dozen maintenance guys and put them to the work. And I, I, I also went ahead and hired extra housekeeping. All I promised was that my hotel may not be up to date with fancy goods. But one thing I can promise you, this hotel is well-maintained and clean, right? Implemented that, started mingling myself with the guest at the check-in and check-out. So I'm always there those two key hours. And then I implemented was that the, uh, there were a lot of workers in that particular area, but no one was catering to them. I started 4 a.m. breakfast, 4 a.m. breakfast. Not only 4 a.m. breakfast, I started cook to order breakfast. And the word cook to order got the business from everyone else. We're all making eggs. We all have burritos. We all have other stuff. We're already cooking them. So I said, it's a cook to order. And then what I did was is that the I started wrapping burritos with the various different, uh, you know, uh, mix you know and then we would have four or five different burritos and these guys they have to be at the project side by 4 30 and um you know uh uh um uh, it, it, you know by 5 a.m they have to be there so we made it where they could actually take the burritos with them and implementing that alone filled up the whole hotel yeah. i was doing over 90 percent occupancy where we were barely doing 15 percent occupancy yeah yeah. It's exactly the same method. So if you look into what your guest is looking for, I have, I have person. the reason I was cracking up is that I personally felt the taste of doing it and, and, and seeing the success that it can bring. Thank you for reminding. We appreciate that. Um, so the next phase, as you're saying, is that the be ready for it and do and take certain initiatives, right? And, 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 and implement those. And the renovation wise, what you're saying is that you need to be obviously with your competitions, right? So you suggest if you need it, you do it. And if you can't afford it, what did you do when you had the nest eggs, right? Well, but I, I would do exactly the same thing as you do. Make sure the hotel is clean, well-maintained and great service on top yeah. of it, because let's face it, um, you know, the product experience is not really differentiating, you know, so people are willing to put up with a room that's not um, completely updated. They're willing to put up with that if you make them feel special. Exactly. You know, the front desk clerk is cheerful and, and is, um, you know, have that personal uh, connection with the guest. You've won that guest. And, and the housekeeper always stops and greets the guests along the hallway and pays compliments, for example, to their children or what they're wearing or something. Well, you want that guest, you know, so it's about how you make the guests feel. The product experience, I think if you can just be on par or maybe even a little less, the guests are willing to over, overlook that. More importantly, it's, it's about how you make them feel. It's all about the feeling. You all said all about the feeling. Uh, that reminds me one more thing that I 
whenever I was at the hotel, I would offer them to take, help them with their luggage. And that's something that they, they have not felt in a smaller town and on an exterior property, you know, so they're like, uh, you know, nobody does that and they appreciate it, they remember that and they come back. So knowing, and, and, and you know, uh, well said when you said that get to know your customer, know their children's name. And I, and I go, to, I take it to the level, get to know their dog's name as well. And it doesn't hurt to have some, you know, dog biscuit around the uh, lobby because, yeah. you know, pet friendly can make you uh, quite a bit of a money when everyone is, uh, in, in a, you know, uh, trying not to have pets at their hotels. So, you know, I always tell people that, you know, have every type of, you know, entertain every type of guest. Just make sure that you don't ruin the whole hotel. So if you're going to have a pet, have pet specific room. If you're going to have smoking, have smoke, you know, don't just go ahead and put any smoker into non-smoking room knowing that he's going to smoke. That's going to ruin your property. Thank you so much. We appreciate the jewels that you always share with us. Um, I'd like to have you back again soon and uh, looking forward to seeing you at the lodging conference. Yeah, same here. It's always a pleasure, you know. I appreciate you. You have Thank a wonderful you. day. Thank you. You too.